that interesting area called positive externalities. So when more people use the appropriate amount of water uh, for sanitation, for food cooking, that sort of thing, everybody's better off because health is better and our costs for our public health system are lower. So that's an area where you actually want to subsidize instead of charging. So for normal uses by people of, and I'm not talking about enough water to wash your Hummer and fill your swimming pool, I'm talking about enough water to clean and cook your food, maybe that should be really cheap, cheaper than it is. Maybe it should be free. Um, and then when a household uses a lot more water, maybe that should be more expensively priced. And so, if, you know, if people are washing their Hummers and watering their estates and filling their swimming pools, they should probably pay for that. And it probably turns out that those are the people who can afford to pay for it. So what I'm getting at is, is sort of an example of how you design the EPR instrument matters in terms of who it's going to impact and whether it'll have a regressive impact on uh, lower income people. And I just wanted to point out that if we're not charging for these things, then we are still paying. We're paying through property taxes. And there have been studies pointing out that property taxes have an, a regressive income effect. Okay, so people at the lower end of the income scale pay a higher proportion of their income on property taxes than people at the high end. So we're not, we're not creating something new with these charges. What we're doing is we're reallocating the charges and hopefully in a way that's not going to hurt low income people. I think it's a good idea to provide subsidies and incentives for things with positive externalities and a good idea to charge for things that have negative externalities. I mean, that's just basic economics. When it comes to doing it at a city level, the challenge with subsidies is that you're not, because it's such a small area, you're not really developing a new technology because your money just isn't, isn't there for it. And Another concern about it is, is that it has a negative impact on the city's bottom line. So people are going to oppose it, saying, I don't want to pay more property taxes, that sort of thing. I think that if you're going to provide subsidies like that, whether it's to solar panels or transit or something, you need to also look at the revenue side and make sure that you're collecting enough revenues to support it. And make sure that you're collecting them from places where you should collect them. So. I think we need not just the carrots, but a mixture of uh, carrots and sticks. And you could do this in what's called a revenue neutral way. So the government doesn't make money or lose money on doing this. Suppose you um, put subsidies into solar panels and you made an agreement with EPCOR to charge people more for regular off the grid electricity or on the grid electricity. Um, so it's, you know, revenue neutral in that way. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's not enough to just put the carrots out there. I don't think it has enough of a behavioral impact. Like you need, you need both. So I think, you know, it's something that I haven't really given a lot of thought to. The question is whether we can have an independent body uh, do a value for service type evaluation of how the new revenues are spent in something like this. Um, I suppose you could do it in a way that's independent of city council, or you could do it in a way that's somehow connected to city council, like by a committee or something. The advantage of doing it uh, with city council is, of course, that they're, you know, legitimately elected representatives. Um, I guess the, the argument in the other direction is you want somebody arm's length enough to, to comment on this stuff and to hold government's feet to the fire. Um, I guess I could, see, I could see it in both ways. I think the city probably does have its own internal audit type processes to make sure of that sort of thing. Uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't hurt though to have, in addition to that, a, a sort of a stakeholder panel or a citizens panel to look at that. How important is regional cooperation in doing any of this stuff? I think it's extremely important. I mean, um, Edmonton, you know, right outside of Edmonton's boundaries is where the sprawl is going to happen if it's not happening inside, right? Uh, so let's, let's uh, Let's take an example. The Greater Toronto and Hamilton area uh, created, um, uh, well, I guess, I, an agency of that area uh, called Metrolinx was created by the provincial government and said, look, you have to consider transportation on a regional basis. So they've created a very ambitious uh, transportation plan and a transportation financing uh, mechanism. And they've basically gone where you seem to be suggesting we go and uh, 
it's been very successful. Like they've they've been able to change the debate there and and uh, have a lot of different people acknowledge. Okay, we need to do things differently. We can't build our way out of traffic congestion. We are going to have to invest in transit. We're going to have to raise the money. Let's look at road taxes. Let's look at other tax options. So absolutely, we have to be doing that, and that requires involving the provincial government. When uh, when you've got cities playing off one another and uh, competing uh, for for residents and business on the basis of say lower taxes or no taxes or something crazy like that, um, you're just going to have a race to the bottom in terms of environmental performance. So yeah, you do need that regional cooperation and you need enforcement of it. In my opinion, yeah. Interesting that that came up in uh, in the municipal elections, uh, land value taxation. As I mentioned earlier, when you look at the total taxation on a property with a house on it, uh, it's based on market value, which means the value of the land and the value of the building on top of it. Uh, there have been experiments in other places that have said, let's separate those two things out and tax them at different rates. So put more of an emphasis on the land value and less or no emphasis on the improvement, i.e. the house on top of it. And the nice thing about that is that when you've got big empty areas uh, of downtown that have cars parked on them or nothing on them at all, uh, then the taxation on that goes up. And so it becomes less profitable to be having vacant land and you encourage infill development. So uh, I think it's Pittsburgh has done that and uh, at the same time they seem to experience a sort of a revitalization of downtown. Uh, so it's, it's something that uh, um, goes back to a guy, I'm trying to think of his name now, George. William George. Yeah. William George is it? it George is yeah, it comes back, it goes back a couple of hundred years that idea. So that is something, I think I mentioned that in my paper as well. So. So comment on uh, public versus private ownership of uh, water and water systems, I, I guess. Um, I think when it comes to something as important to public health as water is, uh, that there's a very strong argument that it should be managed by an organization that is accountable to voters. I mean, if you, if you go back a few hundred years before we had uh, public water supply, we had cholera. And uh, my guess is that when you uh, think about corporatizing or privatizing that kind of service, you run risks. I mean, the, when you've privatized it, the uh, single most important incentive is going to be the profit incentive at that point. And the, the experience in England with water privatization was, was spotty at best. Uh, so. I, in terms of water, I think that there's a good argument that uh, we've got to have a system that's more or less responsive to citizens. And that, that makes sure that those incentives that I mentioned earlier about water are in place. I mean, it should be cheap or free for people to use a certain amount of water, the amount of water that they need for sanitation and cooking. Um, if we start charging a lot for that, we'll have serious problems. I mean, if you take uh, heating and fuel, for example, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, once they privatized that and it started being, they started raising the rates, you had a serious problem with fuel poverty and older people being unable to afford to heat their places and some of them freezing. And so I think you have to be a bit cautious in that area. So. Okay. Um, thank you very much, David. It was interesting. Lots of good questions from people. I, I appreciate that. Um, our time has basically come to an end. Uh, I just want to remind you, though, that we are taping this. This will be on the Way We Green uh, website. And I think David's uh, slides will be up there as we go forward. So that information should be available. Uh, and thank you for coming out. And we'll just continue our, our discussion and dialogue as we work to develop the Way We Green. Thank you again. And thank you, David. Thank you, everyone.